Hi everyone, welcome to chapter 21, simply entitled, Viruses. So viruses are considered non-cellular parasites. They can't be classified in any kingdom, but they can infect organisms, and in fact all organisms are ready hosts for viruses, including plants, animals, and yes, even bacteria. Viruses are composed of proteins and nucleic acids, and so while they are certainly organic, they're not living entities as we know life on Earth. They do not carry out the functions of living organisms. So they don't metabolize, they don't grow, they don't reproduce. By contrast, viruses are not cellular. They don't do all of the things that cells do. They're completely dependent, in fact, on their host cells to produce progeny viruses. No one knows exactly when or how viruses were evolved or from what ancestral source because there is no fossil record. Now, viruses are not new to modern society. Everyone has had firsthand experience with viruses. So if you've had the common cold or you've had the flu in your life, then you've experienced the effects of a virus. And while we all have heard of HIV and Ebola, herpes, viruses now are front page news in the 21st century as COVID-19 continues to impact the global community. And so this chapter is all about viruses. So our objectives here are to define virus and compare a virus to a living organism, describe the general structure of a virus, recognize the basic shapes of viruses, list the steps of replication and explain what occurs at each step, describe the lytic and lysogenic cycles of virus replication, explain the transmission of plant and animal viruses, discuss some of the diseases caused by plant and animal viruses, identify major viral illnesses that affect humans, Compare vaccinations and antiviral drugs, describe prions or prions and their basic properties, and define viroids and their targets of infection. Okay, so you've seen this before, and I just want to show you this to give you an idea of the size of viruses, what we're talking about in these organic entities. So, Adult female is what, about a meter and a half tall. Now here's a frog egg at one millimeter. Now if you'll recall, one millimeter is one thousandth of a meter. Here's a human egg, much less than that, maybe about 30 uh, micrometers. Now micrometer, there's a hundred micrometers there, so one millimeter is one thousandth of a meter. One micrometer is one millionth of a meter. Typical plant or animal cell, somewhere between um, 10 and 100, I guess average would be maybe about 40 to 50 micrometers, whereas a, a red blood cell in your body is about seven micrometers in diameter. Typical bacteria we see here still, you can see bacteria under the light microscope. So you can still see, even though one micrometer is really small, you can still see it with a good light microscope. So there's bacteria there. Um, and some organelles like mitochondria. Mitochondria um, and the average, for instance, uh, E. coli bacterium, about the same size. Now, once you get beyond 100, uh, once you get beyond 99, I guess, uh, nanometers, so we have one micrometer here as one millionth of a meter. Here is one nanometer way down here. That's one billionth of a meter. And so when we, here's a flu virus. And so when we start talking about viruses, we're talking about billionths of a meter, right? You cannot see viruses with a light microscope 
And that's where we need to bring in the big guns, the electron microscopes. So here's the flu virus at about 90 micrometers. And some viruses certainly are much smaller than that. So gives you an idea of the size of the entity that we're talking about here. So what the heck is a virus anyway? Well, who knows? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Not really. We don't know where they came from because there's no fossil record. And so we don't know how long they've been around, presumably for the entire history of the Earth. They don't possess characteristics of living organisms, as we've discussed already. The typical virus is about a thousand times smaller than the average bacterium, and they can only be seen with the electron microscope. Now they vary in morphology. Morphology is the shape and their size. So they vary viruses in morphology, mode of replication, and choice of host. And by the way, um, viruses are very specific to their hosts. They can infect, infect plants, animals, fungi, protists, and yes, even bacteria, as we'll see. Now, viruses can cause illnesses that can kill humans even. So here we have the, the simplest organic um, entity. It's not even an organism, right? It's not even alive, but it's the simplest organic entity or one of the simplest that can wipe out the most sophisticated, most intelligent organism in the history of the planet. How does that happen? Some of the illnesses that can kill humans, AIDS, of course, smallpox, influenza, um, if you know anything about the Spanish flu of 1818-1819, Ebola virus disease, of course, and coronavirus disease, as you all are familiar by now. Much of what to be known about viruses has yet to be learned. So uh, I think this is just kind of a cool picture. Now, this is a bacteriophage, uh, these green elements here. They are bacteriophages or bacteriophages. Now, a bacteriophage is a virus that can infect a bacterium. Here's a uh, typical E. coli cell, which is about five to seven micrometers in length. And so you can see how very small these bacteriophages are. And each one of these is an individual phage. And there's what, 50 there, probably, probably if we could see the whole picture, probably 100 there. So it just gives you an idea of the size of these things if this thing is a mere five to seven micrometers long. All right, let's go to a quick video by Fuse, from Fuse School. What are viruses? Just a couple of minutes long, it's worth your watching. And a quick check. Viruses are considered living organisms because, and your choices are, they reproduce by binary fission, they're capable of independent movement, they ingest nutrients and excrete wastes, and they infect humans. Now this is a think about it question or think about it uh, problem. Viruses are considered living organisms because, well, we know they don't reproduce we know they can't move on their own. They don't ingest nutrients and then excrete waste. That's metabolism. Viruses don't metabolize. They do infect humans, however. But remember what we said not too long ago, viruses are not even considered living. So your real choice should be E, viruses are not living even though they can infect humans. That part is true. So viral morphology, remember that's shape and size. Viruses are non-cellular, they have no organelles, they have no ribosomes, they have no plasma membrane. Their basic structure consists of a genome, it could be either DNA or RNA, but never both. 
and it varies depending on the virus, uh, surrounded by a protein capsid. It's just like a little package made of protein. Now, some viruses have an outer envelope derived from their host cell. Okay, so here we see just a typical enveloped virus. And you see the, the capsid here, um, you can see in this artist rendition, it's a very geometrical shape. And that is extremely common among most viruses. They're very geometrical, as we'll see. Here's the nucleic acid or the genome inside. Now, this uh, is an enveloped virus. There's a phospholipid envelope, and we have these little projections, these um, glycoprotein projections. We often call them spikes, and uh, those are used for different reasons, but uh, one of the main reasons they're used for is to um, connect with receptors on the surfaces of some cells, and that allows the virus to enter the cell. Look at that process shortly. So viruses um, are composed of a protein subunits. Now the subunits are called capsomeres, and capsid genes are encoded in the viral genome. Now the the viral capsid, that is the protein package with the genome inside, is called a virion. And capsids themselves are um, classified into four groups, generally speaking. Helical, that means they are long and cylindrical, kind of rope-like. Tobacco mosaic virus is an example. That's what the TMV stands for. And also Ebola is an example of that. Icosahedral, that's polygonal, many sides, generally 20 triangular faces put together in this nice little uh, kind of funky shaped box. Examples poliovirus and herpes virus are icosahedral envelopes. Some viruses have an envelope derived from their host cell. We'll see that when we look at HIV. And then you have the head and tail viruses. That is, it's a virus that is made up of an icosahedral head where the genome is encapsulated and a helical tail. And we'll see that as we look at bacteriophages a little bit closer later. Okay, so here are some virus shapes. This is from your textbook. Here's the helical. It's just like a long tube. That's the genome inside. But it's sort of like a long tube. We'll, uh, you'll see that in Ebola. It's hard to see the tobacco mosaic virus down here. Here's the icosahedral, and this is just a um, rendition. And then there's the complex. Now, here, this complex virus, this example here is showing you a virus with an envelope. So we said they could be enveloped. Um, the terminology is not set in stone here is what I'm really trying to say. Uh, this is a complex virus. Here's the capsid with the genome inside, and it's surrounded by an envelope that makes it complex. But also, for instance, bacteriophages with their icosahedral heads and their helical tails, they are also complex. In fact, here is the bacteriophage. It's a virus and inf viruses that infect bacteria. We call them bacteriophages or bacteriophages. And they are head and tail viruses, which makes them complex. Don't be confused here. It's not going to get into little tiny details of viruses. So you don't have to worry about that. But they consist of an icosahedral head. Here you see it. Very geometric in shape. And a helical tail. Sometimes this is called the stem. Okay, now some viruses have glycoprotein extensions, as I've mentioned before, on their surfaces, which allow them to bind to host target cells via receptors. The CD4 receptor on white blood cells 
uh, to which HIV binds. HIV has the spikes or the glycoprotein extensions and the CD4, uh, the white blood cells, the T4 lymphocytes have CD4 receptors. We'll see that and the two hook up and that's how HIV gets into the white blood cell, the lymphocyte. Okay, so here it is, HIV and the CD4 receptor. So here's the HIV um, viral capsid. You can see that it's complex. There's the genome. It has these CD4 spikes on it, on the outside. And here's the lymphocyte, the CD4 cell, the T cell with its CD4 receptors. You can see how the little spike just settles right into that receptor. Okay, so here we see it over here. Here's the cell, the virus. It links up to the CD4 receptor right there. It's like they shake hands. And then look what happens diagrammatically. The CD4, the receptor, after it shakes hands, joins hands, I should say, with the virus, it sort of leans over and presents the virus to the cell. In other words, the receptor is telling the cell that this character that wants to come in is good to go. Accept him in, no problem. He's got a ticket. And the cell, here's the plasma membrane opening up and receiving the capsid, the viral capsid. And this is the process we'll see later is called uh, receptor mediated endocytosis. Right? But that's how HIV gets in. Quite an interesting uh, phenomenon there. Okay, let's go to another video by Professor Dave. This is Introduction, introduction to Virology. Uh, it's a, a little bit on the long side, maybe it's about 18 minutes long, but uh, Professor Dave goes into a lot of um, viral morphology and uh, viral replication and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a good one to watch. And here's a quick check. Which of the following statements about virus structure is true? All viruses are encased in a viral membrane. The capsomere is made up of small protein subunits called capsids. DNA is a genetic material in all viruses. And glycoproteins help the virus attach to the host cell. Think about it. Let's take them one at a time. All viruses are encased in a viral membrane. Well, we know that's not true. Be careful anytime you see all, by the way, in a multiple choice question. Not all viruses are encased in a membrane. Some of them are. So that's not true. Capsomere is made up of small protein subunits called capsids. Well, that's actually the reverse. It's the capsid that is made up of small protein subunits called capsomeres. So that's not true. DNA is a genetic material in all viruses. Well, we know that's not true. The genome of viral genome could be DNA, it could be RNA, but it's never, never both. Glycoproteins then help the virus attach to host cells like the HIV virus that we just saw. Um, so that's true. Okay, so viral infections and hosts. Now, as we said, viral viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Now, that is, they must invade a cell in order to replicate and propagate. Viruses are not only host-specific, like HIV with humans, but also cell-specific, like HIV with the T4 lymphocyte. HIV doesn't infect any other cell, only the T4 lymphocyte. And all viruses follow a similar mode of invasion slash infection. That is stepwise, generally speaking again, attachment, first step is attachment. 
Second step is entry, or sometimes you'll see it as penetration. Third step is replication, and the fourth step is assembly. That is, so replication is going to be of the capsid proteins, the capsomeres, and the genome. Assembly is going to be putting everything together into a new virion, and then exit or egress. We'll look at these individually, steps in the virus infection. So here we see this from your text. So this is using the influenza virus. Here's an epithelial cell, epithelial cells. We'll learn this later on. Are cells that line your nasal cavity, your respiratory tract. And in fact, you know that the flu virus, that's influenza, the flu virus, in fact, is, is a respiratory infection. So here's an epithelial cell. Here's the influenza virus. And so it also has little spikes on it. And so it attaches to the plasma membrane. That's step one. Step two, the cell engulfs the virus by endocytosis. And so that's entry or penetration. Step three, we see here the viral contents are released and the viral RNA enters the nucleus where it's replicated by the viral RNA polymerase. It's interesting the way it works because in the viral genome, there is a gene for RNA polymerase. And RNA polymerase um, replicates the viral genome, replication. And then what happens, so, so the viral, uh, the RNA polymerase reads the viral genome and makes the messenger RNA, the viral messenger RNA, and then the host cell's RNA polymerase reads the viral messenger RNA and makes the viral components, the capsomeres and the viral genome. That's how that works. So the virus comes with its own RNA polymerase to make the message, and then the host RNA polymerase reads the viral message and makes more virus. And then those capsomeres and genomes are assembled into new viral particles. And then the new viral particles, the new virions, exit the cell or egress the cell, in this case through budding. You can see it just pops off like a little bubble. And we'll look at, there's a couple of different ways that viruses can exit cells, and we'll see that, but this is just one, okay? All right, so getting the heck out. Here we see egress of the progeny viruses can take one of two forms. And again, they are vir virus specific. Not all viruses use all forms. In the case of budding, progeny leave individually, you know, like little bubbles. Example here is HIV. And here we see HIV progeny viruses budding off of this T4 lymphocyte. Now, eventually, the T4 lymphocyte is going to die, eventually, and that's why in HIV infection, T4 count, T4 lymphocyte count, is such an important thing because the more virus you have, the more T4 cells die, and therefore, the less, T, the, the smaller, the lower the T4 cell count. But at this point, the cell is still alive, and here you see viral particles, um, viral caps as virions budding off without destroying the cell. In the case of lysine, lysine uh, is like bursting, you know, like a balloon. A rhinovirus, the common cold, is one of those. And so here, here you see the um, cell, or it's really a bacterium, and all these little tiny viral particles, all these little dots are viral particles. And what happens is the virus uh, replicates over and over and over again, and the cell just fills up with new virions and many, many, many thousands of virions, and then the cell can hold no more. It's like filling a balloon with water. The balloon can hold no more water, and it just bursts. 
So the cell can hold no more virions, and it just bursts open. Obviously, this automatically kills the cell, and you have millions of little virions floating around in the organism, and they can go each and infect new cells. So every living organism is susceptible to infection by viruses, plants, animals, and yes, even bacteria, as we've seen with bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect DNA. Most bacteriophages are double-stranded DNA. Uh, now, when um, viruses are in a cell and it hasn't killed the cell and it's making new virions, we call that a productive virus. There are viruses that become latent, but if they are actively making new virions, making new progeny, we call that productive. Now, a prophage or prophage is a viral gen when the viral genome gets incorporate incorporated into the host genome, then we call that the prophage. So you can have a situation where you have the host genome here on one side and you have the viral genome on the other side, but when the two fused together, then that's called a prophage. So we have two um, ways of egress here, as you saw in the previous slide. The lytic cycle, where infection leads to cell lysis. Cell lysis is just bursting open or popping open and destroying the cell. The cell dies. And then the lysogenic cycle, where the prophage is disseminated via binary fission. So the viral genome gets incorporated in the host genome, making a prophage, and as that cell divides, the prophage, right, um, gets replicated, and when the cell divides by binary fission, obviously the prophage um, gets received into each new daughter cell, and so on, and so on, and so on. Genic means to create, and so that's what's going on here. Now, there are uh, there's a situation where when conditions become favorable or, or not favorable for lysogeny or the lysogenic cycle, the lysogenic cycle can then um, revert to the lytic cycle and destroy the cell. We'll see that in a minute. And then latency, the virus rem remains in the cell without replicating. A latent virus would be like um, um, the Epstein-Barr virus that causes uh, measles, which once you, once you clear the measles, you have the virus in your body for the rest of your life, and it doesn't do anything. Now, as you get older, it may cause shingles, but unless something, some condition, environmental situation, causes that, the virus will remain latent, or um, in other words, uh, inert or hibernating. So here is your typical uh, bacteriophage structure. You've seen this already. Um, icosahedral head. There is the uh, cylindrical tail. Um, sometimes it's called the body. And then some have these uh, little legs on them. And this is really cool. This is an electron micrograph. Here's the bacterial cell. And you can see just what you see here. You can see it in real life here with these icosahedral heads. And there's your tail or body. And there's the tail fibers or little legs. And you can see the genome, the bacterial genome being injected into the cell. Pretty cool. Okay, the lysis versus lysis versus lysogenesis. Okay, so in the lytic cycle, lytic means cycle that leads to lysis. Here's the bacterial cell. Here's the bacteriophage. You're going to have attachment. The bacteriophage is going to inject the uh, viral genome into the bacterial cell. See, here's the phage, here's the host DNA, or really, this is a bacterial genome. Now, 
here it says the phage circulates or remains separate from the host DNA. Now the phage DNA replicates and the phage proteins are made. New phage particles are assembled. And then the bacterial cell fills up and fills up and fills up until it can hold no more viruses, no more virions, and then just bursts open. That's cell lysis releasing new bacteriophages. Here's the lysogenic cycle where the same thing happens. We have attachment. The genome is in, the viral genome is injected into the cell. The viral genome fuses with the organism, the host genome, there's your phage, and then as the cell divides by vi binary fission, you know, this gets replicated, and so each new daughter cell gets a copy of the viral genome, or the bacteriophage, or the phage genome. Now, if conditions are favorable or, or not favorable, depending on how you look at it, if you're the bacterium, it's not favorable, but look, under stressful conditions, the phage DNA is excised from the bacteria and enters the lytic cycle so that whoop, the bacteriophage gets reproduced and reproduced and reproduced. The cell fills up with bacteriophages until it can hold no more, and then boom, it pops open and releases all of those new virions or, or phages, bacteriophages. So this thing can go on for the longest time, just dividing and dividing, fission, bacteria, uh, binary fission, binary fission for the longest time. And then when conditions suddenly are favorable or, or stressful, then it can revert back into the lytic cycle. So in your quick check, which of the following statements about bacteriophages is False. In the lytic cycle, new phages are produced and released into the environment. The environment is the surrounding milieu. In the lysogenic cycle, phage DNA is incorporated into the host genome. An environmental stressor can cause the phage to initiate the lysogenic cycle and cell lysis only occurs in the lytic cycle. Let's look at them individually. So in the lytic cycle, new phages are produced and released into the environment. That's true, right? Lyse, lytic cycle leads to cell lysis. The cell fills up with bacteriophages. When it has too many phages that it can hold, like the water balloon, it bursts open. The phages are released into the environment. That's true. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA is incorporated into the host genome. Lysogenic, right? So the, the cell is going to stay alive. So it gets incorporated in the host genome and binary fission, binary fission, on and on and on and on for the longest time. Now, an so that's true. An environmental stressor can cause the phage to initiate the lysogenic cycle. Well, we know that from lysogenic, you can go to lysis, but you can't go from lytic to lysogenic. So this is not true. Cell lysis only occurs in the lytic cycle. Well, that's what the lytic cycle means. It Lytic leads to lysis. So that's true. So C is the statement about bacteriophages that is false. All right, plant viruses. Most plant viruses are single-stranded RNA. Most, not all. Now, plant viruses cannot enter the plant or plant cells on their own. They need some help by way of damage to a leaf or a fruit or the trunk, or the stem, um, or some disease causes, again, damage and makes, a, makes an access for um, the infection to get in it, the virus to get in it, or they can enter by way of a vector. Now, a vector is an insect or another organism that carries the virus into the plant. So if you have a, 
um, an insect uh, that houses that carries the virus that is a carrier for the virus and it eats eats into the leaves and regurgitates some of that stuff or some of its saliva um, comes out with the virus in it then the, that can infect the plant that way okay so that's a vector or by pollen now if you have um, a situation where the virus has been incorporated into the host genome and you and the plant makes reproductive cells pollen or male reproductive cells for plants then that viral genome is incorporated into the host into the pollen or into the male's genome and then that can be passed on when the plant reproduces all right, therefore the virus is transmitted between plants. So horizontal transmission is when the virus travels from one plant to another. So by way of reproduction, vertical transmission is when the virus is transferred from parent to progeny. So if the virus viral genome is already in the host genome, as the host genome um, gets replicated during reproduction, then the daughter cells, the new daughter cells, plant daughter cells will carry that viral genome also. Okay, so that's a vertical transmission from parent to young or offspring, horizontal transmission from plant to plant. Some uh, symptoms of plant viral diseases, just familiarize yourself with these. Hyperplasia, so hyperplasia, Hyper means above and beyond, above normal. So it's hyper growth, hyper growth above normal growth. Uh, we call these galls or tumors. Here you can see these galls on this leaf. I've, in the woods, I've seen galls on the trunks of trees. Hypoplasia, by contrast, hypo is below, below normal. So hypoplasia means that there's below normal growth. Where you see thinned leaves and often yellow splotches, as you can see here. Cell necrosis. Now, necrosis is death. So, cell death, the dead or blackened stems, leaves, or fruit. So, here you see a necrotic peach. So, a virus can certainly get in that way. Abnormal growth patterns by way of malformed leaves and stems or fruit. And discoloration, yellow, red, or black lines in stems, leaves, or fruit, um, which are symptoms. Again, these are all symptoms of viral infection. By way of animal viruses, animal viruses do not have to penetrate the tough cell wall of bacteria and plants. They can, they can just land on a cell and then get ushered in, as we've seen with uh, HIV. So we call that receptor-mediated endocytosis um, the, uh, with regard to non-enveloped virions. Non-enveloped, they bind to cell surface receptors and they are, I say welcomed in, in quotations, ushered in, right? They shake hands and they're welcomed in uh, by the cells. In other words, they are presented to the cell and the cell says, okay, no problem with you, come on in. They open the door. Rhinovirus um, or the virus that causes a common cold is one of those. Fusion is where, the en where an enveloped virus fuses with the plasma membrane and the capsid, the virus capsid is released into the cytoplasm and that's HIV. Remember that in the diagram that I showed you. It's it's kind of a kind of a cross, right? The HIV presents, uh, connects, shakes hands with the CD4 receptor that's cell mediated, and endocytosis by way of uh, envelope fusion with the membrane. Progeny virus virions exit their host cells via budding, as we've seen with HIV, or via lysis. Okay, now with regard to human viral diseases, um, I'm, this is just a quick deal here. I'm not going to get into viruses and your chapter at the end goes into vaccinations. I'm not getting into all that. That's not important for us at this stage. So acute viral diseases um, 
This is just terminology that you should understand. Symptoms accumulate very quickly, and then the virus is eliminated. Examples are common cold and the flu, right? You feel bad today, and you're in bed. You can't get out of bed tomorrow because you have the flu. But in 7 to 10 days, it's gone, and you feel great. Same thing with the cold. That's acute disease. Chronic disease is long-term with long-lasting symptoms like hepatitis C, where those symptoms... Um, where your eyes, the whites of your eyes glow yellow, you have pain in your um, midsection because your hepatitis C infects the liver. Those, those symptoms are long-term. They last. They're long-lasting. That's chronic infection. Intermittent is when symptoms come and go. A great example is herpes, simplex either simplex one or simplex two both but if some of you have herpes simplex one then you suffer from cold sores sometimes they're called fever blisters and in the summertime comes you go to the beach and you're out in the sun and you get a, a fever blister or cold sores two names for the same thing but you don't have fever blisters or cold sores all year round that's intermittent asymptomatic is when you're infected but you don't have symptoms. An example would be shingles. If you've had the um, chickenpox virus uh, as a kid and you've gotten over that, the virus is still there. So you are still infected, but you have no symptoms. Now, later on in life, when you become an adult and you're 60, 70 years old and things get stressful or your body starts to break down, you might get a case of the shingles. But Unless that would happen, you are asymptomatic. You're still infected, but you're asymptomatic. You have no symptoms of disease. And then there are oncogenic viruses. And as you know from previous studies, onco means cancer. Genic means to generate or to create. So viruses that cause cancer, like the human papilloma, virus HPV causes cervical cancer not all viruses cause cancer by the way hepatitis B virus HBV causes liver cancer human immunodeficiency virus you know that is HIV causes lymphoma which is a type of cancer of the lymphatic system and so there are some viral some viruses that do cause cancer or have the ability to cause cancer all right one last video for you to look at, just for interest's sake. Uh, it's entitled Oncolytic Viruses from the Terry Fox Research Institute, and it talks about um, researchers now using oncolytic viruses, viruses that can cause cancer, interestingly, to treat cancer. So they're using oncolytic viruses to attack tumor cells to inject um, chemicals, to inject um, products, synthetic products, into tumors in order to kill the tumors. Very interesting to watch. It's only three or four minutes long. That does it for Chapter 21 viruses. Preguntas. Um, Message me, email, however you want to do it, and we'll move on to Chapter 22. Thanks. See you next time.